Hello, my friends. I'm Gene Dallasala, president of Audioholics, and we have... Hugo Rivera, vice president of marketing. How are you, Gene? Always good, my friend. Same here, man. Well, listen, today I want to cover an interesting topic. I was watching this awesome video on YouTube from Dr. Tool, and he was mentioning how, you know, audio is kind of like a combination of art and science, and this is not really exactly what he was saying, but it was something along those lines. Right. Okay. So... I said to myself, man, that is so true, you know, and uh, I think that's a topic that I want to discuss today, you know. Yeah, you know, there's there's always two camps to everything, right? There's the the guys that are all into the art, they reject the measurements, they reject the science, it's all the voodoo, it's, you know, they believe in their magic. Yeah. Then there's the guys that, that measure sound quality with a ruler and a protractor and a measurement device, and if it doesn't have a flat curve, it's not good. Mm-hmm. And I say extremism on both ends is not a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because you don't you don't want to be in the in the camp that is listening with with mathematical measurements because that's not listening, you right. know. And of course, you don't want to be either in the camp that you know is making stuff up and basically bending the laws of physics because they say, well, you know, it sounds better if you go ahead and do it that way. Yeah, you don't want to rely too much on a microphone because yeah. our ears don't hear like a microphone exactly. too. So, you know, as Mr. Miyagi said, balance is, tea, is key to karate. <laughs> Absolutely. If you don't have balance, you better back up and go home. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. Okay. So, you know, I do think there's an exa there's a very good science to audio. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, the guys at Harmon, especially Dr. Floyd Toole, has really brought a lot of science to a field that has almost no standards. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So I do think there's a minimum set of standards that are required. You know, according to his research, and we have the article you can link up that They've come up with a pretty good algorithm on measuring a speaker's response and predicting subjective listening preferences. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you want to have a speaker that has flat on-axis response with very wide dispersion mm -hmm. and, and consistent dispersion. You want the off-axis measurements to be have a consistent shape to the, to the primary axis mm -hmm. measurements, the on-axis measurements. And it's not rocket science, guys. You don't need... It is no magic to it. You use good drive technology, you use good crossovers, a narrow baffle, it's not that hard to do. Don't listen to the guys that measure everything with a protractor to say you need <laughs> thousands of measurements, because that's BS. I mean, even Harman has it down to like 70 measurements, okay? Mm -hmm. And even that, I mean, if you get the first 60 degrees off axis of the speaker correct, you're probably gonna be good all around too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's not that hard. It really isn't. And um, I do like the measurements. I use measurements myself to see if there's a problem with a product. Okay, if I see a huge suck out at a certain frequency and I measure it on and off axis and it's still there, I know that's not a measurement anomaly. I know it's a problem with the product. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily say one speaker sounds better than the other by looking at two different graphs and, and say, this is definitely gonna sound better than that one. I do wanna hear it. And of course, you know, they, there's arguments out there that say you, can't, you gotta listen to it blind. You can't listen to it sighted because sighted influences you. Yeah, you know, there's some truth to that, but, but at the same experience, audio, the experience of audio is not only just listening, but it is visual too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you want to be proud of the product that you have. Mm -hmm. I, all the people that say you can't look at the product because it'll bias you, what are you telling me? Are you telling me that your product you're making this claim about your product is so ugly that nobody's gonna <laughs> like your product if it's ugly you have to then go through the wife acceptance factor okay so from a marketing perspective it will be much harder to market such a product yeah and you don't hear pe you don't hear people when you're going to buy a car you don't hear people saying you got to drive that car blind yeah <laughs> because <laughs> you're gonna think that the Ferrari drives better than the Kia because it's a Ferrari no the Ferrari drives better than a Kia because it is a Ferrari. Exactly. Okay, so there are some, you know, there are, <laughs> there are some hard and fact rules about that. And, you know, a $300 speaker that has, you know, budget drivers in a small box is not going to compete with a $30,000 speaker that's properly designed. So, I mean, let's use a little common sense here. The science is great. The art is great. But let's use a little logical judgment here as exactly. well. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't like to just dumb down uh, audio into science only. Mm -hmm. I mean, five years ago, you would have said, Gene, get a turntable and listen to some vinyl. I would have laughed at you. I'm like, vinyl is inferior in every way to CD. 
And I'm not even talking about high res SA CD or DVD audio. I'm just talking about CD. It's inferior on paper. It's inferior with signal to noise ratio. It's inferior with distortion. It's inferior with frequency response. But you know what? I've got a collection of about 50 discs now, vinyl discs, all jazz stuff from like the 50s out to the 80s. And these vinyl records sound way better than their CD counterparts. And it's not because of the technology necessarily, but it's because of the recording process and how mm -hmm. it was preserved and how they did recordings back then and didn't compress the hell out of everything. Yeah. I'm loving vinyl. I mean, I've got, how many speakers we have in this room? I have like seven speakers plus four yeah. subs. Mm -hmm. I would say about 70% of the time we're listening to two channel audio and I would say about 80% of the time, especially when my wife comes up here, we're listening to vinyl or we're listening to SACD, but vinyl is, is here to stay even after it's been around for over 100 years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, there's also that melancholic component to listening to a vinyl. You know, we all remember how it was when we were younger and we were listening to our 45s and you know oh yeah our vinyl records you know it's something we grew up with so it's something that we enjoy listening to so that falls more into the art aspect of it does audio. and you know, the, you know the art aspect there is yeah the vinyl might be more colored sounding mm -hmm. but you know what some people might prefer that i am not at the point where i believe to say that everybody hears the same way and everybody has the same preferences i'm sorry That's to say that yeah. I know there's research out there that's been said that you know people's very consistent with hearing. I haven't found that to be the case with mm -hmm. people. I've I found people so. that prefer, a lot of people like to turn the bass up, a lot of people like to turn the treble up. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how a lot of these speakers like the Bose Cubes sell at the stores because they have a boom and sizzle. Bose knows at 50 hertz and 7 kilohertz, if you hit those two spots and you bump them up in the EQ, the, ca the common listener is going to walk by in a, nosy sh in a noisy show floor and gravitate towards that speaker because it's colored in those frequencies that they like. It, it's interesting, Gene, because what happens also is that the majority of people are not really trained listeners. That's okay? true. So the market really makes full use of this, okay? And then it just goes towards people's preferences. Right. So if they want to go ahead and hear the sizzle and whatever else, well, here's your system. It's in a box, you know? That's it. They're happy campers. They walk out happy campers. They call their friends. They call you sometimes. Hey, man, you're going to go ahead and listen to my system. I got 1,100 watts out of this $400 receiver that weighs 15 pounds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you have a lot of that, too. So, I mean. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's... I think a lot of people haven't been exposed to a really high-quality recorded event or even, you know, an unamplified listening event. Right. So, it's without having a good reference to what good sound is. And let's also say that reproduction doesn't necessarily have to follow production of sound. Mm -hmm. Producing the sound at a live event is a different experience no matter how you look at it compared to reproducing it in your home on a loudspeaker system. Whole different ball game. Yeah, absolutely. So I do think measurements are important. We measure speakers, we measure amplifiers, we debunk the myths. So we try to cut through the BS and get to what matters. But we're still not at a point, especially with distortion measurements, we have not been able to quantify the types of audible distortion that comes out of speakers with listening preferences. It's not been done. And all, a lot of the loudspeaker measurements done out there today, whether it's the NRC or it's any of the magazines, they don't do dynamic testing. They don't do compression testing. Speakers misbehave as you play them louder. But you look at the frequency graph, especially on the manufacturer's websites, they look like a rule. They were drawn with a ruler from 20 kilohertz to 20 hertz. Right. They smooth the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they give you a scale that's 140 dB instead of 40 or 50 dB, and it's just. And they measure it at maybe 85, 90 dB, where the mm -hmm. speaker is behaving great because it's at a low power level at one meter. 90 dB is nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, you know, just because you think someone's got all this science when they show you this ruler straight graph on their website, just realize there's conditions in how they measured, made those measurements. Absolutely. The conditions of the test have been highly manipulated to produce that graph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Especially with subwoofers. When, it, when a subwoofer company tells you, oh, we have extension down to 12 hertz, a tweeter has extension down to 12 hertz. <laughs> it might be at levels only a NAC can hear, but it still has extension down to 12 hertz. <laughs> That's so true. Oh my goodness. I think the take home message is, Gene, logic is the beginning, not the end. Okay? Yes. Spock said that. He did. Right? And on top of that, balance is key. It is key. You know, don't be on the far end of things because you will always be wrong about something. So. Yeah. 
you know, I think, in fact, all of this stuff can be applied to everything in life. Absolutely. Whether it's music, listening, bodybuilding. Bodybuilding, definitely. Or women. Or, yeah, absolutely. You guys, you know. Absolutely. Awesome. So with that said, I think I'm just going to invite our uh, viewers to just comment below. Let us know what they think, you know. Uh, we always love and welcome everybody's opinions. And uh, also, if you like this video, click uh, the thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you get our weekly videos uh, sent to you. With that said, thank you for watching, and until next time. I have one question. Go for it. Are you guys team art, or are you team science? <laughs> let us know which you are and why. <laughs> that should be interesting. Well, let us know if they're like right in the middle. They could be right in the, yeah. in the middle. Sure. You know. So, that's it. Until next time. Keep, Keep listening. listening.